Welcome to today's lecture where we're going to be looking at integumentary pathologies. So we're going to start it off with everyone's favorite, parasites. Here we can see we have mites. When we talk about mites, these are going to be microscopic animals that are going to burrow into that top layer of the epidermis, or that stratum corneum. And what's going to happen is the body's going to have an allergic reaction or just a hypersensitivity to all the excrement and the eggs that these mites are going to lay down. And this is what causes the allergic itchy reaction. So here we can see we have our mite. It's going to find your epidermis, burrow on down, and eventually make itself a nice home where it's going to lay its eggs. And what's going to happen is these mites are going to be easily spread with skin-to-skin -skin contact or even skin-to-clothing, skin-to-sheets. Um, anywhere where the mite is and it comes in contact with your skin, uh, you can be at risk for infection. And the problem is it's going to spread before the symptoms develop, so it's going to be easily transmitted in a group of dense people uh, sharing the same space, so things like prisons or um, dormitories. And they can live up to three days off the host, so it's hard to uh, get rid of them once they're there. So some of the signs and symptoms of mites is a typical visible red trail. So where the mites uh, lay down and burrow, there's going to be a trail uh, of their um, existence. So it's going to lead to a progressive, unrelented itching. Uh, but the diagnosis can be tough. Uh, we'll see with a lot of these uh, dermatological pathologies that they're basically all rashes, and rashes are very similar in appearance. So it's very difficult to say what one rash is and what, ra what one rash isn't. So you have to you always go to a dermatologist. Even if you went to a general practitioner, they're a lot of times not comfortable looking at the rash and saying exactly what it is. They're going to recommend you to see a specialist. So as massage therapists, it's vital that we don't try to guess what it is or what it might not be. Uh, so we're always going to play on the safe side and avoid any rash uh, unless we have a doctor's note or something very specific that tells us what it is and what we are possibly touching. Because if we were to touch it and we were to catch it on our hands, uh, your entire uh, week or even month might be over massaging as you wait for uh, whatever disease you caught to uh, be corrected. So you're always going to err on the side of caution with rashes. Some other parasites is going to be the head lice. So specifically, head lice is going to be a wingless insect that lives within your hair. So here we can see our um, hair strands with the lice gripping on nice and tight. And what the lice is going to do is it's going to be a parasite sucking the blood from your scalp. And it's going to use that blood to uh, uh, lay its eggs. And it's not so much the kind of crawling around that causes the itchiness. It's the saliva in the uh, lice louse's mouth that irritates and causes a reaction on top of the scalp. Uh, but also, the lice can technically be a disease vector. We don't see this so much in first world countries, but in other countries, um, it is possible. So you always want to be careful with any parasite that uh, uh, finds your blood. But super common demographics, 12 million cases in the U.S., mostly in school children. I know my kids had lice three years in a row, uh, kind of the bane of having long-haired girls who sit close together on a bus. So how are they going to spread? It has to be through direct contact. So they don't jump or kind of uh, go from host to host easily. Uh, they can be dislodged if they were uh, severely disrupted, say with like a hair dryer. But uh, when we talk about how they get from person to person, there's going to be different fomites. If you remember from our previous lecture about uh, pathologies, uh, fomites are going to be kind of carriers of a certain disease. So in this case, hairbrushes can carry uh, lice, hats, scarves, costumes, uh, wigs. So you just don't want to share things uh, between people if they're in that risk group or you know if they're around. So insects, uh, they can be hard to find. Uh, typically, they're pretty good at running away once you start kind of poking around in the area. So it's not as easy to see a live louse. Uh, if you can see a bunch of live lice, it means it's a pretty uh, bad infestation and they've been there for a long time. It is, however, much easier to see the eggs that they lay. Uh, here we can see these little white dots within the hair, and these uh, eggs are called nits, and the nits are going to be glued to the uh, shafts of the hair. So, um, and these eggs are going to take about 7 to 30 days to hatch. Here we take a close-up look of what the nit, and um, as you uh, try to treat the lice, you're going to go through and try to pick all these nits off, and that's where the uh, phrase nitpicking comes from. If you're a nitpicker, 
you're really taking your time going through everything. That's what you have to do when you're trying to uh, treat a lice infection. It takes hours every day to go through and pick each of these little eggs off. Uh, similar to head lice, we have body lice. Uh, so they're closely related. Uh, they can interbreed, but they're only going to live in clothing, not so much on the host. So you'll find them in the seams of your jeans or the seams of uh, your jacket. Um, so it's more common along people with like little to no access to laundry facilities. So long as you're washing your clothes and uh, treating them uh, normally, uh, body lice isn't quite as common, at least in uh, our area. But again, you can see the nice little blood pouch here from sucking on your blood. Next, we have pubic lice, also known as crabs, and these are going to be parasites that infest the coarse body hair. So the pubic hair, uh, armpit hair, uh, beard, mustaches, eyebrows, or eyelashes. So you can see they look uh, fairly uh, different than a regular lice does. And the signs and symptoms is they basically, you can, they're a little easy to see with the naked eye. They're going to actually look like crabs. And again, the itching is going to be pretty relentless. Here we can see in someone's eyelashes, there's going to be multiple lice. So let's take a closer look because this is everybody's favorite lecture and why not? And yeah, you can see this is the crab shape here. And it looks like you might even have some other type of uh, lice there as well. And I'm guessing those are eggs. So how are you going to treat these? Uh, body lice can be treated just with proper laundering, so not so bad. It's the head lice that become difficult to treat. So the mites, head lice, and crabs are all going to be treated with pesticidal shampoo. Basically, you're just going to lather the shampoo wherever the lice are, and it's going to kill any living um, parasites. Uh, the problem is it can be toxic to yourself, so you don't want to leave it on too long or overuse it. And it's going to have to be continuously reapplied because the over-the-counter stuff can't kill any of the nits. So basically, you're going to kill all the live lice, uh, wait a couple days for some of the nits to hatch, reapply it, and kill those newborn lice, and then kind of rinse and repeat for at least a couple weeks when you know you can be safe. So you can buy a prescription uh, uh, pesticide shampoo. That's going to be able to kill both the nits and the live, uh, but you can't really get, uh, insurance doesn't cover it. I know it cost us $300 when we finally gave in and got it. So it was worth to get it after the third infestation. Uh, you can use a uh, nit comb, or I like to call it the pain in the ass nit comb, because uh, my daughter has really thick hair. But basically the idea is you're just going to run these very fine tooth combs through the hair, and it's going to just gather all of the uh, nits and live lice uh, in one sweep. So in theory, it works good. It's much uh, more difficult uh, to get through on certain types of hair, but uh, you definitely still need to use something of that sort. And then any uh, bedding, clothing, or upholstery that might have come in contact with this person's head, you're gonna wanna put in a trash bag, tie it up with duct tape, and just leave it in the corner for at least two weeks. And then that way, anything that was on there is gonna die off because there's no host uh, to feed off of. So you're going to want to do that uh, just to be safe and not uh, spread it around. So when it comes to massage indications, uh, the risks are going to be rather low for transmission. We're not really touching head to head so much. But if you do know someone has lice, you are going to want to delay that treatment until after uh, they've been uh, properly treated and rid of the lice. Uh, nothing I've ever seen or at least known uh, to be aware of. And again, a lot of us aren't going to be working with the uh, younger kids who are at more of a risk. Uh, I don't know if I told you guys earlier in the year, but they are seeing it more common in uh, kind of teenagers or young adults now. Everyone taking selfies. They're putting their heads together and they're taking the selfie and they're mixing their uh, lice up that way. So uh, if you're a selfie person, uh, just be mindful who you're taking your selfies with. Moving on to fungal infections, uh, here we have a couple terms that it's going to be good to kind of recognize that we're talking about fungal infections. They're going to be known as mycosis, and they're caused by a specific type of fungus called a dermatophyte. And the lesions that they're going to cause are all going to start with the word tinea. So anytime you see tinea, uh, you know we're going to be talking about a fungal infection. So we're going to talk about the most common types of tinea infections. Again, these are very common. Especially in warm climates, fungus love to grow in warm, wet areas. This is why we see it uh, in the groin region, especially in the foot region where we wear socks and uh, put them away in our dark shoes. 
So again, athlete's foot is very common. So what's going to cause it? Again, it's going to be transmitted via touch, whether that's skin to skin. So as massage therapists, our hand touches a fungal infection, it can be transmitted to our hands. But it can also be skin to something else. So if you're in a locker room and you're walking around in your bare feet, if you stepped where someone else uh, stepped that had a uh, fungal infection, it is possible to pick it up. So you always want to be careful to walk around with some kind of protective layer, uh, especially on the bottom of your feet if you're walking around in areas of high traffic. So even in the clinic, sometimes I see some of you guys walking around barefoot. You never know if the clients might have one or even your fellow students. So it is recommended that you do wear shoes uh, in, while you're massaging uh, anywhere, basically. And what's going to happen is those dermatophytes are going to dissolve that keratin and invade that stratum cordium. So again, we're still talking about the epidermis, the, the very superficial part of it. And they seem to be fond of the skin fold. So if they can find a nice fold of skin where it's extra dark and maybe the moisture kind of settles, uh, it's going to be an ideal place for that uh, fungus to grow. So here we can just see the more common types of names. We're going to go over a couple of these. First one, we'll start. The head is going to be tinea capitis. Again, capitis is going to mean head. So this is a fungal infection of the scalp, mostly seen in pre-adolescent children, but uh, it can cause permanent hair loss. So this person here has their tinea capitis fungal infection. He probably won't grow hair there anymore. I know a couple of people where that's been the case. Tinea corporis, you're going to want to know as a uh, ringworm. This is typically called ringworm. But uh, do know that there are no worms associated with this. It's just kind of a technical, uh, just part of the name. But this is mostly seen on the trunk and extremities. Uh, scratching can spread it. So again, as you scratch the skin and you move those dermatophytes around, it's going to infect that new area. But it's going to look like expanding rings, so circular shaped like that with maybe a healed center. So again, corporis, corpo means body. Tinea cruis, I want you to know, is a, the technical name for jock itch. So this is going to be a fungal infection within the groin region. More common in males and females, again, uh, probably because there's a couple, a little bit more folds in the area. But it's associated with warm, damp conditions and tight clothing. So bathing suits, if you leave it on for too long. Uh, it seems to spare the penis and the scrotum. So it's going to appear more on like the thighs and the low back. And finally, we have tinea pedis. Again, pedis or pedal is going to mean foot. So this is athlete's foot. Uh, they say it begins uh, in the third or fourth digits, but it can begin anywhere on the foot. But again, because of those digits, there's just more crevices for it to grow. But it's going to have a classic itchy, very itchy and burning feeling. And what can happen with any of these fungal infections, uh, you might form blisters. And then when you have a compromised uh, wound or skin condition, uh, there's always risk for a secondary infection. So bacterial infections could come in, and then you've just compounded the uh, uh, pathology even more. There's one called tinea versicolor. Uh, this is going to be an overgrowth of a common yeast found on the skin. So we always have a certain colony of bacteria, or many colonies of bacteria, many colonies of yeast, that normally just live on our skin. And they should serve an important function, because uh, they're going to kind of take up the room that bad bacteria might try to take over with. So we want that uh, common yeast and bacteria there. But what happens with tinea versicolor is there's this overgrowth of that common yeast for some reason. Uh, what's important, though, is it's non-contagious. So if you did know somebody who has this um, and you're confident they have it, the doctors told you they have it, you can massage somebody with tinea versicolor. There's no risk to you whatsoever. Uh, so, but the signs of it are going to be patches of skin discoloration. So it can be lighter or darker here. We can see it looks lighter on this person. And it's going to typically be on the back, chest, or upper arm, so the upper torso region. And they might be possible mild itching or scaling. You can also have a fungal infection of your fingernails or toenails, and this is called onychomycosis. Typically, what's going to happen is the toenail or fingernail is going to have a very brittle yellow uh, uh, look to it. So again, if that were to happen, you would just avoid uh, touching the toes of that person. Uh, but overall, the signs and symptoms of all these fungal infections is that red scaly uh, patch that progressively gets bigger. Uh, you, again, you'll form, possibly form uh, blisters or pus-filled sores, which can lead to secondary bacterial infections. But all these are going to be very, very itchy. So you're going to want to treat them as soon as possible. 
And that's going to be done with uh, over-the-counter topical or oral antifungal medication. Um, here you can see just a nice powder spray. It comes either spray or cream. I know from personal experience, uh, the spray just seems to work better as it hits everything. Uh, the cream, maybe not so much. But you definitely want to see like tolfaninate is going to be the key drug. So you're always just going to want to look for uh, the active ingredient in it. Uh, Photodynamic therapy, so sunlight and uh, certain types of light can also help clear it out. So you'd always want to put your shoes, clean them, put them out as well. Sometimes you might even want to just get a new pair of shoes because even after you put the uh, treatment on, the lesion is going to go away and your skin's going to look clear, but you're going to have to keep applying that treatment for at least two weeks to make sure all those dermatophytes have been destroyed. Uh, if you stop the treatment, they're just going to keep coming back. And if you did treat it and you put your foot back in that, uh, Infest, infected shoe that wasn't uh, properly cleaned, it's going to come back that way. So it can be somewhat of a pain to fully get rid of sometimes. But the key point is you want to keep your skin nice and dry uh, and prevent it from uh, being in dark, damp places for too long. So as far as massage indications, you definitely want to avoid touching any fungal infection whatsoever. Again, if you were to touch somebody that had it on their foot and you massage the rest of your body, you could have possibly spread that all over their body, which would be a terrible thing to do. Not only that, you're putting yourself at risk because now it's all over your hands. And then if it, uh, you had an infection, you didn't know about it. Uh, each client you massage, you would possibly infect as well. So you want to be extra cautious with any type of fungal infection. Again, this is why we're not touching any rash that we don't know about. So it's at least a local contraindication. So if somebody had athlete's foot, uh, they could just leave their socks on and you can massage the rest of your body and you would never know. So a lot of times if people do leave their socks on, they probably did it for a reason. Either they don't like foot massages or they're too embarrassed to say they have an uh, athlete's foot and they just want you to skip their feet. So don't try to press them and be like, are you sure you want a foot massage? Because they probably have a reason why they don't want one. Here we have herpes simplex virus, more commonly known as just herpes or HSV. And there's going to be different strains of it. There's HSV-1, which is uh, commonly what we consider the uh, herpes, mouth herpes or oral herpes. And then HSV-2 is uh, typically known as genital herpes. Uh, but this distinction is no longer considered uh, very important. There's so much intermingling between the genital and oral regions. Now that the herpes virus is, you can have one or the other in both places, so that's not so important anymore. But herpes is very, very common. More 90% of adult Americans, say over 50 years, have been exposed to herpes. So if you were to test their antibodies to see if they uh, ever fall off herpes, 90% of uh, people are going to come up positive. Uh, the thing is, just because 90% of people have it doesn't mean there's going to be all 90% are going to be symptomatic or express cold sores or any types of sores. So most people are going to be silent carriers that never even knew they had an infection to begin with. So what's going to happen is this oral herpes is going to be transmitted through either oral or respiratory secretions, whereas the genital herpes is more transmitted through mucous membranes, so the urogenital tract membranes. But once you get herpes, it's going to stay in your body for the rest of your life. So we're going to look at a little uh, diagram of how this works, but it's going to lay dormant, and then when it gets the opportunity, it's going to express itself. So basically, it hides away in a nerve cell. So each cell we know has a cell body. So it's going to hide in the cell body of a nerve uh, near the spinal cord called the dorsal root ganglion. And then it's just going to wait there until the immune system becomes suppressed enough where it can sneak out and reinfect uh, the nerve and express itself on the skin. So this is why we call them cold sores or fever blisters, because when your body's busy fighting off a cold or some other type of uh, insult, the uh, herpes is going to sneak out at that opportune time. Stress is also another one. And it's going to always kind of reinfect that same area. So it's going to be spread through uh, skin to skin is going to be the easiest. But depending uh, on the virus, uh, herpes in particular is pretty stable outside the host. So um, if you were to touch something that someone else happened to touch, so say like a utensil that wasn't properly cleaned, uh, you could transmit it that way as well. And it's also going to be in high concentration of blisters. So you'd want to avoid any outbreak. Uh, like in this case, it would be lots of blister, uh, lots of virus uh, particles shedding in that example. So looking at what's happening here, again, we can see our spinal cord down here. And we're going to have a sensory nerve that's innervating the skin. So we saw 
the skin's a highly innervated uh, organ. So what's going to happen is you've been exposed to the herpes virus. It's now going to infect those free nerve endings uh, within the, the uh, epidermis. And now you're going to have the primary infection, so you'll see those uh, uh, possible um, sores. Like I said, some people don't always get them, but well, in this case, this person got the sores. And now this virus is going to be transported all the way up the axon and uh, find itself in this cell body in the dorsal root ganglion. And it's here in this dorsal root ganglion where the HSV is going to live now. So eventually those sores are going to go away, but the virus is now still within your, in your, beside your body. So now it's just going to wait until your immune system is compromised. And then once it's compromised, it's going to travel back down that axon, go back to the uh, free nerve endings, and you're going to have a, uh, the sores reappear. So this is going to happen uh, either frequently or infrequently, depending on your immune system and how it handles the herpes infection. And there's going to be different types of herpes, and they're going to be classified by where the sores uh, show up. So oral herpes, we know, is cold sores, again, because of immune suppression or stress. So it's around the lips or the mouth, and this can be a lifelong problem. Uh, I know uh, my daughter, she gets cold sores at least once a year, and it's definitely a pain to deal with. Here we have general herpes, and you can see uh, same Basic idea is uh, the oral herpes with immune suppression or stress is going to cause an outbreak, but it does seem that the frequency outbreaks does decrease over time, but it can be found on both the genitals, buttocks, thigh, or low back region, so the general entire midsection. Uh, there's something called herpes whitlow, and this is going to when, when you have a herpes infection uh, in the nail or the nail bed of the, one of the digits. Uh, the book says it's common among dental hygienists, or at least it used to be. And it uh, still happens when toddlers suck their thumb. So again, if they had uh, oral herpes and then put their thumb there, you could transmit it to another part of your body. So uh, as massage therapists using our hands, we just have to be careful not to touch any open herpes wound, uh, especially a lot of times with these uh, skin pathologies. Um, so long as we have good hand hygiene and we wash our hands and we have no compromised uh, skin on ourselves, uh, we shouldn't have too much of an issue. It's if you're given a massage and you had little cuts or nicks on your hands, and it gives an opportunity for those pathogens to find their way in. So this is why if you do know you have a cut, you want to wear a Band-Aid, a glove, or that liquid skin to cover it up. You never want to massage somebody when you know you have an open cut on your hands. It's never worth the risk. You can have herpes gladiatorium. This is going to be herpes in the torso region, also known as mat herpes. So it's common to see among athletes that there's a lot of skin-to-skin -skin contacts. So in this case, wrestlers is going to be um, the kind of stereotypical example. So along with uh, the HSV-1 and 2, there's also uh, other strains of herpes. Uh, for instance, uh, herpes zoster is going to be shingles. And shingles is going to uh, originate from reactivated chicken pox. So if you had chicken pox early in your life, Again, that herpes is going to live within your nervous system, and it's going to be expressed when the immune system's weak. In this case, uh, we generally see herpes in adults over 50 or 60, because as you get older, your immune system uh, isn't quite as strong, and that's when herpes zoster can express itself as shingles. Uh, but this doesn't mean young people still can't get it. Uh, I've known plenty of young people that have had shingles. Uh, one of the ideas is maybe because uh, the chickenpox vaccine is uh, so good at what it does, uh, adults are no longer kind of coming in contact with little kids with chicken pox anymore. So we're not getting this natural booster from all these little kids with chicken pox that um, the body kind of, the immune system doesn't recognize the herpes zoster quite as easily as maybe it did back in the day. But here you can see shingles is going to start. It's basically just going to look like every other rash we see. So it's not very distinct on what it is. But then as it gets uh, through its stages, it becomes a little more clear. So this is like a mild kind of case in a small area, but you can have herpes zoster uh, make up a large area as well, as you can see in this guy in the picture. And what's going to happen with herpes zoster is that uh, virus is going to kind of find its way in one specific nerve tract. So as that HSV is hanging out, it's only going to reactivate along a certain dermatome in the body. So here it's going to cross the thoracic region. So we could probably say that this shingles virus 
was hiding out around the, the T8, T9 area, and it's only going to infect this part of the body. So you wouldn't see any rash down here or up here. And it usually is going to be on one side, so it won't infect both sides of the spine. Typically, it's one side. I've heard of cases where it can do both, but generally, if you have a rash just on one on a unilateral side of the body, uh, that's kind of a clue on what it might be. So the sinus symptoms, as we saw, it's going to be um, the large red rash, but uh, you'll also get this kind of tingling sensation before the rash shows up. So if you're someone that gets cold sores, you kind of have an understanding of when one might be coming on. So when you start feeling that tingling, you're going to want to start your treatment as soon as possible. But generally, those scabs, uh, those blisters will scab over in seven to 10 days and heal. So there's no way to eradicate the virus once it's in your body, it's in your body. Uh, but we can shorten the outbreaks with antiviral medication. So commonly uh, known brands are Valtrex or Abreva, and they're going to shorten it. So the sooner you can take those antivirals, the better. Especially if you have shingles, you want to get it within those first three days. After three days, uh, you're at the risk for suffering uh, neuropathy where there's actual damage to the nerves, and that can cause long-term chronic pain. So again, anytime you have a rash and you don't know what it is, you want to get it checked out sooner and later because you wouldn't want it to be something like this where you waited too long to start the proper treatment. Uh, as far as massage indications, again, any active in infection is at least going to be a local contraindication. So if somebody had a cold sore, we wouldn't work their face um, at all. Again, we're doing the laundry, so that should be a problem. So you're just avoiding any open sores. General herpes, you, might, you probably wouldn't even know if they were suffering an outbreak at all. But there's not going to be any benefits for massage. If somebody's stressed out, you might be able to help them de-stress a little bit, and that um, might help uh, kind of secondarily. Now we're going to move on to bacterial infections. So the first one is going to be a staph infection. Uh, full name is going to be Staphylococcus aureus. And there's going to be different names depending on location or subtype, so we're just going to go over the most common. So generally, the infection is going to begin either in the hair shaft, so that hair follicle, or in the compromised skin region. And it can damage the body in two ways. One, the bacteria is going to uh, infect healthy cells, and that can hurt it that way. But it's also going to, the bacteria is going to release uh, kind of toxic waste. So just the metabolic processes from this bacteria is going to release um, toxins that destroy the area. So we saw that with tetanus. The tetanus what toxin was what the uh, bacteria was releasing. But it's commonly found in nasal patches and skin. So if you were to put a swab in someone's nose, uh, it would probably come back positive for staph. It just isn't a bad area. Uh, the nasal passage is used to having it there. So that's not really a dangerous area. It's when it gets other places in the body where it becomes dangerous. But it can be transmitted person to person or from person to something else. And it's going to be very dangerous if it gets in the bloodstream because then it can trans. Um, anywhere in the body and uh, can lead to serious problems. So a common one's going to be a boil. Uh, this is a local infection. Um, I won't ask on the test, but if you ever see the terms furnuncle or carbuncle, uh, it means we're talking about boils. A furnuncle is going to be a single boil like here, whereas a carbuncle is going to be a group of multiple boils. Um, it's going to be similar to acne, but it's much more aggressive, much larger, and it's going to be more painful. Uh, we can have something called folliculitis. Folliculitis is going to be when there's superficial inflammation, uh, that hair follicle. So here you can see all these little uh, spots of uh, infection, and you can see that hair shaft coming out of each, the middle of each of those uh, blisters. Uh, this is also what we could, if it happens in the eye, we're going to call it a sty as well. So folliculitis is rather common as well. And the one you really want to be worried about is called MRSA. Uh, MRSA is going to stand for methicillin uh, resistant staph A. Um, it has basically what this means is it's resistant to the antibiotics we usually use to treat uh, bacterial infections. So because it's resistant, it wasn't around forever. It was, had came out after antibiotic use. So it was discovered in 1961. And with most of these uh, antibiotic resistant uh, infections, they're going to start in hospitals because that's where a lot of bacteria is, and that's where a lot of the antibiotics are. So it spreads there. But now it seems to be widespread in the community. So places like gyms, uh, the floors or mats, especially like in yoga studios, or anywhere with this high-density, low-hygiene uh, spots where the bacteria can kind of live. 
So this is why when you ever go to the gym, you always want to wipe down any equipment you use beforehand as well as after to avoid uh, a serious staph infection. So again, it's going to be resistant to the penicillin group of antibiotics. Uh, there's also something called a pilindial cyst. Uh, this is going to be a large encysted infection at the base of the sacrum. So right above that gluteal cleft in this region here. Uh, they're going to frequently reoccur, and a lot of times they're going to be surgically removed. And the reason I point this out is because it's not uncommon to be massaging somebody's back, and you'll see this scar generally in that uh, sacral region, and that might be indicative that they had a pilindial cyst, and the scar is just uh, an aftermath of when they were treated. So they would kind of clean out the cyst and then stitch it back up, and there would be a scar there. Uh, I'm going to talk about hydrodentitis serpentiva. I probably screwed that up. But this is going to be a deep infection of both the axial and groin region. Uh, and it's going to onset during puberty. So there's going to be a genetic component to this. It's not very common. The reason I like to talk about this is because I had a client. She was always coming to do yoga in the wellness center I worked at. But she was always kind of, um, she felt embarrassed to get a massage because she didn't want to talk about this. Or sometimes the wounds might have a little bit of a smell to them. So she didn't feel very comfortable getting any type of body work. But uh, the yoga teacher and the acupuncturist kind of recommended me because they knew I knew a lot about uh, just different pathologies and I was good with working with uh, clients like that. And so she was finally convinced to get a massage and she regretted waiting so long. But she definitely suffered uh, terribly because of this because you can see these deep, deep wounds that uh, they're just going to generally uh, always be there. So uh, lots of things can kind of bring the flares up. And eventually they're going to have to go get surgery and clean out all the tracks of the infection as they, there's even a lot underneath this. So the picture you're looking at here is a healed kind of recovering one. Uh, an active infection is going to be much more angry looking than this. Uh, so sign the symptoms of staph again, classic red pink bumps, hard and painful. Uh, they'll increase in size and painfulness. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pus sometimes within the abscess and they could rupture but eventually they will resolve. Uh, if not, uh, you would go get them lanced by a doctor or take oral antibiotics. But uh, if you do get anyone treated, a warm compress and loose closing seems to help too. So again, for massage, local contraindication. Anytime you see something, even if you're not sure if it's a pimple, a boil, or whatever, uh, if it looks angry and painful, especially if there's a white head and a risk of kind of uh, scraping it, you're going to want to avoid the area as best you can. So as far as boils or something uh, more serious, especially if it's MRSA, you're not touching that person whatsoever. So uh, another type of bacterial infection is going to be a strep bacteria. And it's going to be similar to staph. It's going to enter the body through a compromised skin. And it's going to easily spread. And there is a high risk of becoming systemic. So the two types that the book goes, talks about is going to be uh, cellulitis. Uh, this is going to be an infection of the deep layers of the skin. Often you see it in the lower leg, uh, sometimes the face, but there's no absence or draining room. It's just going to be this kind of diffuse red uh, looking area. Uh, another type is something called necrotizing fasciitis. So again, necro is going to mean death and fascia is fascia. So this is basically flesh eating bacteria. Uh, again, that bacteria is secreting toxins that causes uh, uh, death to the cells around it. And this is a very serious condition where it can go from a minor wound to life-threatening within hours. So I highly recommend you don't Google necrotizing fasciitis. It's going to look uh, like the craziest zombie pictures you've ever seen. So uh, not uh, good to have. And so strep, this is going to be the same type of strep you have in your throat, except it doesn't damage the throat like it could the other areas of your body. So again, it's going to matter where these infections take place and what strain as well. So sign of symptoms, similar to the other bacterial, uh, but there's going to be signs of systemic infection. So fever, headaches, swollen lymph nodes as the body's trying to fight off the infection. So again, because it's bacterial, you're going to be taking antibiotics. And if you did have necrotizing fasciitis, you'd be having surgery to move any of that dead tissue. So for massage, uh, do not massage anybody with an active strep infection because it is going to be systemic. Again, anytime there's a fever, uh, you're not going to delay the massage till the fever goes away. 
looking at warts then, what I want you to know about warts is they're going to be benign growth and they're caused by the human papilloma virus, also known as HPV. So again, warts are very common, mostly seen in children uh, or people that are immune compromised. So here we can see the wart on somebody's finger right here. So as far as the viruses that cause warts, there's going to be hundreds of different strains of them. They cause different types of warts. Um, and they're going to be spread through direct or indirect contact. So again, as massage therapists, we need to be careful that we're not into, uh, uh, touching warts without uh, our knowledge. So they're going to grow in areas frequently irritated, so the knees and elbows are common, fingers as well. And if the, the area is bleeding, it does increase the risk of spreading it, so you need to be careful with that. So we'll just look at a couple type of common warts. So going by name, the common wart, this is the one we usually associate with, so often on the hands, feet, and elbows, and just a hard flesh-colored growth. You can have warts on the bottom of the foot, so they're going to be called plantar warts, and they can look like a callus. Uh, again, if you did have them yourself, you wouldn't want to try to clip or cut them or file them, because that's just going to spread them, uh, cause the virus particles to shed, and possibly spread it to more parts of the foot. So you'd see a podiatrist, and they would uh, uh, treat them or take them out. So as far as how to treat them, you can use salicylic acid, which is over the counter, or you can get liquid nitrogen as well and freeze the wart off. Um, there are some oral or topical medications. I don't think I've ever had a wart, so I've never tried any of these, but I'm pretty sure the salicylic and cryotherapy work fairly well. So for massage indications, again, local contraindications. I know there's been multiple times where I've been just, you know, massaging somebody's fingers or hands and you feel something that doesn't belong there. And it's probably a wart, but again, as long as I don't have any cuts or uh, skin compromises on myself, uh, there really wasn't anything to worry about. Plus, I'm guessing my immune system is fairly good at handling HPV, so, or at least the common strains of warts, and uh, I don't need to worry about. And we'll talk about HPV more when we look at the reproductive system, because HPV can is one of the few uh, viruses that can cause cancer. So we'll talk about... Uh, the cervical cancer, throat cancers, and especially the HPV vaccine. Moving on to rosacea, this is going to be an idiopathic skin condition, so we don't know what causes it, uh, and it's going to usually affect the face in that middle third, so the cheeks across the nose. Uh, so it's mostly seen in fair-skinned uh, people, but common with 16 million in the U.S. having uh, a mild and sometimes severe version of rosacea. So again, those causes are unknown, possibly genetics, uh, or again, that common bacteria that lives on everybody's skin. Some people might just be sensitive to a certain type of that bacteria. Or there's also, I didn't get to show you guys the videos, but uh, we have little mites that live all over our face. They just, they're always there. And they think one of the possible things, they might be sensitive to the uh, normal mites that live on every human uh, body. But there are predictable triggers. Uh, seems that sunlight, wind, or cold temperatures, alcohol, uh, steroidal anti-inflammatories, or stress could be uh, things that lead to a flare-up of it. So again, the signs of symptoms are going to be that rash on the face, mild to severe. Um, it does seem to get progressive uh, without treatment, but uh, it's more of a, it's not going to really hurt you. It's just going to have an effect on your self-esteem and public perception. So still serious, but uh, not uh, as far as health-wise. But for treatments, you just want to be careful with what lotions you're using. You probably would want to avoid the area if it looked red at the time. Somebody with rosacea would let you know if you could or couldn't touch the area or what triggers might bother as far as lotions. Here we have acne vulgaris. This is just the typical acne we all know about. So again, small localized infections, typically in the face, neck, or upper back, but anywhere on the body you could have acne. Uh, it's going to be the most common disease in the U.S. with the majority in adolescents, and we'll see why. So 40 to 50 million people suffer from acne. So part of the etiology of it is going to be a genetic predisposition, but what it is, it's going to be overactive sebaceous glands. So some people are just going to be predisposed to having overactive uh, sebum production. And if those uh, ducts get blocked, that's when acne occurs. 
And it's going to be stimulated through uh, the production of androgen. Uh, testosterone is going to be the hormone uh, that we mostly see. And testosterone causes more sebum. So uh, especially during puberty or any hormonal shifts, uh, that's when an outbreak of acne is more likely. Other things like ex uh, environmental exposure. So if someone were to take anabolic steroids, sometimes you'll see these really big guys in the gym with acne all over their back or shoulders. And chances are uh, they might be taking a excess uh, testosterone, possibly. So there's going to be different types. Uh, again, pimples we all know about. Here's everyone's uh, kind of favorite video I like to show of an extractor taking out blackheads. Some people love watching this and some people just turned off uh, the video. I promise I won't leave it up too long. Uh, cysts are going to be similar. Uh, their infections trapped in the dermis, uh, but they can lead to permanent scarring. So cysts are going to be like a more serious type of pimple. And then we have blackheads and whiteheads, which I briefly talked about in the last lecture on the integumentary system. So blackhead, again, is going to be the open pore uh, where they, it just oxidizes and turns wax. The closed comedone is going to be the one where there's pus and we have a whitehead. Uh, as far as treatment, it's going to be important to wash the skin, but you don't want to overwash it because what's going to happen, the body's always trying to maintain homeostasis. So as you're uh, washing away all the sebum, it's going to be like, oh, something's wrong. We need to increase production of sebum. So now you're just kind of overproducing oil. So you're kind of throwing everything out of whack. So the more you wash it, the more oil you're going to produce, and it's going to uh, get more out of hand that way. So you just want to be careful to... Uh, gently wash the skin and not overdo it. Uh, try not to touch your face as much as possible. Again, your hands are dirty. Touch your face, you're going to be clogging your pores. Uh, using gentle soaps, I took this picture from my bathroom. So uh, I used to have acne as a teenager, and uh, teacher oil uh, seemed to be the best soap for me. Uh, it wasn't very harsh or drying of the skin, and you can get this at Ulta or the body shop. So I recommend this. Uh, if you have acne. Uh, and you can take uh, benzoyl peroxide. I was on that before. That is the most drying thing in the world. So you want to avoid benzoyl peroxide if you uh, have to. But again, if you have terrible acne, you're kind of running out of options. The more serious, uh, you can take topical oral antibiotics. But again, you want to avoid antibiotics uh, as much as you can just because while it's going to kill the bacteria that uh, infect the pores, it's also going to kill all the other bacteria in your body, which can have uh, other serious effects. Uh, you can take retinoids or Accutane. Uh, these are very serious drugs. Again, never took these, but people that do take them, uh, women, uh, because it can cause birth defects if you're pregnant, you have to be uh, prescribed birth control pills to make sure you can't get pregnant. And there's a lot of things that go into being able to take Accutane. Uh, it was in the news a while ago. I don't know if they changed something about it, but I'd have to look into it. And then you can do like chemical beals or uh, estheticians can work on it as well. As far as massage, you're going to be massaging people with pimples. Uh, it's just a thing that you always come across. So again, use your best judgment. Generally, it's pretty easy to see if a pimple is going to be painful or just um, kind of unnoticeable. A lot of times I'll be massaging someone's back. They'll be right in the middle of their erectors. So it'd be kind of weird to avoid it. So I'll just ask them, is this pimple sore here? And if they say no, and like it doesn't have a white head and it doesn't look like I'll uh, uh, damage it in any way, usually you can just massage over it. Because some people, there's just going to be so many pimples uh, impossible. But it depends on the size, shape, and kind of condition of the skin overall. Uh, as far as um, other considerations, uh, definitely when I was in massage school, lotion was much better than oil. Any type of oil would uh, kind of cause a breakout for me. So uh, water-based lotion. And again, if you can take a shower right after getting a massage or using even, even a hot towel is always a nice thing to add to kind of kind of strip away any of those uh, lubricants. Moving on, we have eczema and dermatitis. So dermatitis, again, dermatitis is going to mean skin inflammation. And if we call something dermatitis, generally we are talking about something that's not due to an infection. So in that case, there's two different ways. With eczema, it's generally a hypersensitivity reaction in the skin. So it's something um, within the uh, system is being uh, oversensitive. And that's contrary to, say, contact dermatitis, 
where that's going to be inflammation caused by external contact with either an irritant or an allergen. So like laundry detergent or a type of soap would cause contact dermatitis, where eczema is generally something uh, that develops within the body and is expressed in the skin. Again, very common with 18 million in the U.S. Here, I was able to take a picture of my wife's hand with all the coronavirus going on. She's been washing her hands at work constantly, and uh, that's a, a recipe for disaster for somebody that has eczema. Uh, so again, mostly due to hypersensitivity reasons. Uh, there's, we don't really know what causes some of the kind of atopical dermatitis. But the flares can be triggered by rough textures, uh, detergents, excessive moisture, and it's definitely going to be made worse by scratching. So it's going to be itchy. You're going to want to scratch it, but uh, scratching is just going to make it worse, and it usually makes it even more itchy. So you have to fight the urge to scratch it. So as I said, uh, atopic dermatitis is going to be the most common. That's going to be what you see here in this picture. And it's going to be itchy, red, flaky, and dry. Uh, another type is going to be uh, dyshydrosis. Uh, this is what I actually uh, suffer from. Uh, this is going to be, you have these tiny little fluid-filled uh, blisters. They call them blisters. They're um, not typically what you think of like a blister. They're much, much more tinier. Uh, and they're going to generally be on the hands and the feet. So if you have sweaty hands or sweaty feet, it's that moisture that's going to cause a problem, uh, especially during the change of seasons. Um, the weather seems to affect it as well. So I know when I have to do uh, hot stone massages, I have to be careful I can get a uh, kind of flare up with my dyshydrosis. So sometimes I'll sleep with mittens on my hand and put lotion on. So the more kind of um, hydrated I can keep my hands as far as lotion, uh, the more it keeps it at bay. It's when it's cold weather and it dries it out with the sweat on it that it gets worse. So if it is real bad, uh, you identify the triggers and what's causing it and try to avoid them. Again, maintaining hydration, so moisturize as much as possible. And then at, um, for as far as medicational treatments, uh, steroid creams are going to be uh, what work really well. So here is one that me and my wife get to share. And uh, you just want to be careful not to overdo steroid creams because it can thin out the skin a little bit and it makes your hands a little bit weaker as far as uh, um, the pressure or the stress you put on them. So I wouldn't do any manual labor. It's a good reason. Uh, for massage indications, uh, again, uh, massage might make the itching worse, so you just wouldn't want to irritate it by going over it, and certain lubricants might make it bad as well. And uh, if it is real bad or they scratch themselves, you're just avoiding any open lesions whatsoever. Benefits, uh, if you had a good hydrating lotion, uh, could be beneficial. Next, we have psoriasis, and this is going to be a chronic inflammatory skin condition where their epidermal cells peripherate at an accelerated pace. So normally, uh, the epidermis renews itself every 28 days. In the case of psoriasis, this renewal is going to happen every couple days. So it's very, very uh, excessive. And what's going to happen is you're going to end up with these uh, patches or plaques of psoriasis where there's an excessive amount of uh, growth. So demographics, any age, but particularly ages between 10 and 30, as well as in some older adults. And what seems to cause it is there's some kind of impaired immune response going on. So risk factors are going to be things like genetics that runs in families, environment, and some uh, possible systemic inflammation as well. So the sign of symptoms is you're going to have these elevated, thick, uh, red skin areas covered with uh, kind of a silver, white, scaly uh, patch. Uh, the skin's often going to be cracked or encrusted, uh, and it's definitely going to be painful and itchy. And in some cases of psoriasis, like psoriatic psoriasis, uh, you could have uh, painful joints as well. So as far as treatment, the aim is going to be re to reduce the inflammation and try to slow the growth of those epidermal cells to prevent the plaques formation. So they're going to be rated on how severe the case is. So somebody with mild psoriasis could get away with topical medications or corticosteroids. Uh, moderate, uh, you might try things like phototherapy, antihistamines, and uh, certain types of uh, bath solutions. And then uh, if it is too severe, uh, you'll end up on some type of immunotherapy or biologic that's going to target the specific part of the immune system uh, that might be dysfunctioning. So some classic ones are going to be like uh, Humira, or Tesla are the common ones. Humira is one of the most uh, common drugs that people are on. 
And that's going to be for people with autoimmune diseases. We're trying to kind of to tone down the immune response with those. So here we can look at the effects. Somebody with uh, fairly severe psoriasis, and then you can see your Tesla after 16 weeks. Uh, so these drugs work uh, fairly well. You'll just have to be on them for a significant amount of time or all the time. So the risk with massage therapy, again, if somebody were to have psoriasis, you'd want to avoid any broken skin. Uh, but if it was just dry skin, you could use lotion with no issues. So because stress may play a role in the onset or exasperation of psoriasis, a massage might be helpful uh, along those lines. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple types of skin cancer. Uh, I don't expect you to know a whole lot, but you should be able to just recognize the more common ones, uh, like basal cell carcinoma. This is the most type of common type of skin cancer, but it's very slow growing. Uh, it's going to typically be on the head or the face, but it's going to rarely metastasize. So if you remember when we say uh, metastasis with cancer, uh, it means the ability for the cancer to move to other areas in the body. So in the case of basal cell carcinoma, that rarely happens. So that's a good thing. So about 80% of all skin cancers uh, in the U.S. are going to be basal cell cancers. So as with any cancer, we're talking about mutations within the cell's DNA. So things that might trigger that are history of UV radiation. So with any skin cancer, uh, the sun uh, exposure is going to be one of the leading causes of damage to the skin cells. So the more uh, exposure to UV rays you have, the higher risk for skin cancer. So this is why sunscreen or proper protection is uh, super important uh, for the longevity and health of your skin. Uh, other things like genetics, uh, chronic skin inflammation or injury. So just like how UV rays injure the DNA, if you had constant wounds or constant injury in an area, you're going to be uh, putting those cells under stress and it could cause damage in the uh, DNA that way. Uh, toxic exposures, same thing. Uh, toxins can hurt the DNA. So you'll see all those with different types of cancer, not just skin cancer. And there's going to be different types of basal cell carcinoma. I'm not going to go over all these individual ones, but their names are here uh, just for reference. I would never expect you guys to know this or Mblex to ask it. So this is just for completeness sake, not for uh, really making you guys know it. But the signs and symptoms, uh, if you have a sore that doesn't seem to be healing or a sore that comes and goes in the same place for no obvious reason, um, uh, you might want to start thinking to get that checked out. And they can resemble other skin issues, like it might look like a mosquito bite or a chronic pimple. So always keep that in mind. So it's always good to kind of uh, examine yourself, uh, your, the condition of your skin, and see what's going on. So as far as how to treatment, Generally, it can just be surgically removed and you'll cut it out and you're good to go. As far as massage, uh, there's no real risk, but as massage therapists, we're in a unique position where we can kind of recognize uh, uh, the changes on some of our regular bodies. So if you're massaging someone and you see uh, either one of these suspicious uh, marks or a mole that seems to be changing, uh, we have an opportunity to bring this up to the client because maybe they don't look at the backside of their body very often and they just haven't noticed it. Um, so we can point it out to them, but the key idea is that you're going to bring it to the client's attention without causing alarm. So you're not going to be like, hey, I think you have skin cancer. That's exactly what you don't want to do. Uh, what you would say is, hey, I noticed that you have this, uh, you know, mole or mark on your back and uh, I think you should go to your doctor and get it checked out. And you just leave it at that. Uh, generally, I've done this a couple times, and people generally either know about it or they're thankful and they'll uh, take it from there. Another type of skin cancer then is going to be squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this is going to be cancer that develops in the keratinocytes, and again, caused by overexposure to sunlight. So generally, you're going to find it in areas that are exposed to sun, so the face, ears, nose, lips. But uh, there is a little bit of higher risk of metastasis, so a little bit more danger than basal cell. Again, different types of it. You'll need to know about them. So treatment's going to depend on the stage and the location. Um, if they can cut it out, great. But uh, they might do topical chemotherapy or freeze it off with cryotherapy. Uh, the one that you definitely need to know about, I'm going to ask questions about then, is going to be malignant melanoma. And this is going to be cancer that originates in those melanocytes, so the uh, pigment uh, cells within the skin. So here you can see in that basal layer, we have our melanocytes and the pigment's going to go up through these higher levels in the epidermis. 
So it can be found in the skin, eyes, reproductive tract, or digestive tract. But the thing with malignant melanoma, again, malignant is going to mean bad. It's very prone to metastasize. So it can go to the liver, bones, and CNS uh, fairly uh, uh, easily, rapidly. So if you catch it early with any cancer, there's a good prognosis. So generally, if it uh, only is about 0.07 millimeters deep within the skin, that's a good sign. But if it gets deeper than that, like greater than 4 millimeters, then it was more likely to get to the capillary system or the blood system and metastasize to the other areas of the body. And that's when you're going to have to have more uh, drastic treatment. So luckily, this is the least common type of skin cancer, but it's definitely the most dangerous type of skin cancer. So out of 61,000 diagnoses a year, uh, one in six of them are going to die. So 10,000 deaths per year from it. Again, different types of melanoma. But what we need to know is um, how to recognize the signs of uh, a cancerous uh, melanoma. So again, it could be changes to pre-existing moles. So a mole that was typically normal and now it starts to change, that's going to be one of the telltale signs of possible melanoma. So the way to kind of judge if a mole is cancerous or not is the ABCs of melanoma detection. So basically, uh, if a mole is asymmetrical, so here you can see this is a nice round area, and now it gets all jig-jaggy over here. Uh, that's one possible sign. Uh, B is going to be for borders are indistinct. So you can kind of see how the borders kind of just diffuse into the rest of the area. Or a typical mole, like uh, maybe this is a little better typical mole. Uh, it's very kind of distinct. It's, you know where the mole is and where it isn't. Uh, colors are going to be mixed. So here you can see red and black or purple and black. So it's not all one like, color like brown. Uh, the diameter is large. All these moles are going to be rather large compared to a typical one. And then E is for either elevated, so the mole uh, kind of bulges out from the skin, or it's evolving, so it's constantly been changing over the months or years. So um, at a certain age, you're going to want to go to a dermatologist and just get a routine skin check where they kind of take marks of these moles and look for any changes, especially if you're in a high risk population where if you work outside a lot in the sun, uh, or if you're at the beach and you tan a lot, uh, those are going to be high risk. Next, we're going to move on to burns. Uh, we all know what burns are. This is going to be damage to the skin, either from heat, chemicals, or radiation. Um, it can affect inner surface as well. So if you were eat or drink something hot, you could burn the digestive tracts or possibly the respiratory tracts if you breathe in steam. So as far as thermal burns, you're usually looking at temperatures over 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but the severity of damage is going to depend on both the temperature as well as the contact length uh, which it was on your skin. So we're going to go over this when we talk about hydrotherapy. Uh, we're all going to learn how to do hot stone massage. So it's not just the temperature of the stones, it's how long you leave it on the client's body for as well. These are the things we're going to have to look out for uh, to keep our clients safe. But you can also have chemical burns, so acids and bases uh, can easily burn the skin as well. And this has to do with uh, the level of pH as well as how long it's on the skin. So acids are typically uh, more superficial depending on the acid. Uh, the more serious ones like hydrochloric or hydrofluoric are going to be much more uh, uh, serious than the typical acid burn. But alkali burns are generally worse because they can penetrate through the fatty layer of tissue, so they'll burn deeper. But either way, if you're working with uh, very low or very high pHs, you want to take uh, the right precautions to avoid any contact with the skin. Uh, not something we deal with uh, within uh, the massage profession. So you shouldn't come in contact with too many chemicals like that. But we can classify burns on how deep down they damage uh, the skin itself. So in the case of first degree burns, we're going to have mild, uh, superficial kind of burning. It can be faint, painful, but it's just damaged that superficial epidermis. So the key thing is there's no blistering. So you'll get the redness, uh, but no blistering. And this was uh, my back, as you can see here. The kind of spray uh, suntan lotion is great for kids and getting uh, them covered quick. But if your wife doesn't rub it in uh, after she sprays you, you get a nice... Uh, pattern to show off for a couple weeks. So always rub in any spray uh, suntan lotion. 
you should avoid it overall just because you don't want to breathe that stuff in either. Second degree burn then is going to be deeper down in the dermis, but the classic sign for second degree burn then is going to be uh, blistering. So whenever we have blistering, uh, we have a second degree burn. Whereas a third degree burn then, the, you've damaged the dermis and all the and deeper layers as well. So it can go all the way down to the bone or all the way through. So now you're destroying cells, glands, hairs, nerves, uh, basically everything in the way. And you'll have uh, black charred edges to the burn as well. So very, very serious. Um, I didn't feel like showing a picture of it because there wasn't very good ones to show that you probably want to look at. But generally people say sometimes... Sometimes, like I've heard, that third degree bones aren't as painful just because the nerves are dead now, too, or second degrees might be more painful. Um, but either way, I wouldn't want uh, a third degree burn. So, as far as treatments with first and second degree, uh, you would use a soothing lotion and possible antibiotics to avoid any infection. But third degree burns are going to be much more serious medical thing where you need to clean the tissue out, you're going to have a lot of dead tissue. So this is what we call debridement, is the removing of that damaged tissue. Um, not a fun time to uh, have done. And then you also have skin grafts and plastic surgery. So they'll generally uh, get healthy skin from somewhere else and grow it uh, where you're missing the skin to try to cover that up. Because again, you don't want uh, that open wound uh, exposed because your uh, barrier to the uh, outside world is compromised and it's very easy to catch an infection with these third degree burns. So for massage indications, it's going to be a local contraindication. So if somebody has a burn, you're not going to be touching it. Um, it can be kind of up in the air when it comes to like mild sunburns. Generally, you don't want to massage it, but if it is very mild, uh, there shouldn't be too much of a problem. You just wouldn't want to put heat on it. So you need to kind of use your best judgment uh, when it comes to like those cases of mild sunburn. But overall, on the MBLEX, if they ask you, should you massage sunburn, uh, you don't go maybe. The answer is going to be no, it's a local contraindication. Uh, if you do have a healed burn, uh, there may be some sensory deficits if the nerves are damaged. So they might not be able to, uh, you might have to modify your massage a little bit, uh, especially if they can't feel the deeper pressure or certain types of things like hot stone, if they can't feel if the stones are too hot. Uh, with third degree burns, you can end up with something called a contracture scar. And what's going to happen as that skin heals itself, uh, it's going to lose a lot of its pliability. And uh, you're going to end up with a contracture where you can't move that joint through a full range of motion. So it's going to limit joint movement with a contracture scar. Another type of scar is a hypertrophic scar. Not has anything to do with burns, but any type of cut, uh, you can get a hypertrophic scar. And what's going to happen is the uh, Connected tissue that's laid down is going to kind of overflow those boundaries a little bit and be raised up. So you'll kind of have this uh, enlarged area. It may or may not be permanent. And close to that, we have a keloid scar. And this is going to be when you have an overproduction of collagen that causes this kind of permanent raised mass you can see here. Uh, this can be caused by any damage to the skin itself. So people that are prone to keloid scars, generally uh, people with darker skin are higher prevalence. So you'll see if like this person got like their ear pierced, you could form a keloid scar uh, anywhere like that. So you'd have to be careful and they're not easy to treat. I don't know all the options for it, but you couldn't cut it out because cutting out would just cause another keloid to form. And then finally, the last one is the decupitous ulcer. Uh, this is more commonly known as a bed sore or a pressure sore. And what's going to happen is uh, certain areas of the body, there's not a lot of space between the skin and underlying bone. So when you sit down on that area, uh, you're compressing the skin against the bone and you're going to cut off the blood supply. So the skin compression is going to lead to inadequate blood flow. And whenever there's lack of blood flow, you're not delivering oxygen to the area and the tissue can end up dying because of that, and you're going to form this wound in those areas. So here in this picture are the common areas where the skin comes close to the bone. So it's a very common issue with 12 million people in the U.S. per year. You're going to see this more in the elderly, bedridden, wheelchair-bound uh, population, or if they have spinal cord injuries, so people that can't easily move or shift positions. So even as I'm sitting here giving this talk, um, I can kind of move back and forth to kind of change the pressure points of where uh, the bone is hitting uh, the skin. So 
That's why I put anatomy teachers who make PowerPoints all night long. Uh, it's definitely uh, uh, the bane of having uh, being skinny. And that is everything. So again, the key takeaways for uh, this pathology is I'm going to ask questions if it's contagious or not contagious. So how we're going to know that is if it's bacterial, fungal, um, parasitic, and what's the fourth one? Parasitic or viral. So bacterial, fungal, viral, parasitic. It's any of those four. Uh, it's communicable, can be contagious. So we wouldn't massage any of those four. The other ones like rosacea, skin cancer, um, are going to be non-contagious. So those aren't going to be as bad like scars you can massage. Um, I'm also going to ask you if it's bacterial. One of those four you should know. Uh, so a wart is going to be HPV, so it's viral. Herpes, viral, strep, bacterial, athlete's foot, fungus. Um, other than that, well, during our live review, we'll go over what else. But again, the quizzes are now up. So please take both the anatomy and the pathology integumentary quizzes. And I will see you guys on Wednesday.